And today we have uh, Nora Challoner is going to be hosting this event. She's the president of Yorkland's Green Hub. And we have, um, we have some videos um, with uh, Bob Giza, um, Matthew Isles, and Kiki Danninger. And Kiki is also here with us live. She's going to be presenting her own video. So I will now uh, turn this over to Nora as soon as I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Hmm. Oh dear, I've lost my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Call the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. Oh dear. Mice will be mice. Yeah. Hmm. There we go. Is that better? No, that's pause share there. Okay. Oh my goodness. I can't believe I there we go. Okay. All right. Now, are we back to Nora? We are. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Go, Nora. <laughs> it's lovely to be with those of you who are here for sure for this virtual event. Um, I think you've done an amazing job, the Two Rivers, this year to have all of these events virtually. But because they were virtually, done or are still being, um, we have been able to make a couple of videos that we're absolutely thrilled about in the PowerPoint as well that after we show you the videos. We've had a really busy year because it's a huge year for your clients. Um, the selling of the property will probably take place within the next few months and um, we are gearing up well for that. So I think the first thing we'll do is start with the um, the Blue Dot Trail. For those of you who, ha who um, have not been on the site, the Blue Dot Trail is um, is in the main driveway, goes all the way up around in a loop. So you come back to York Road um, when you're finished where you started. So it, We've done a specific video. We have a map of the site which helps people to orient themselves and to understand what some of the specific parts along the trail are. Uh, so I want to show you that first and then we're going to follow that with a biodiversity video um, that we're really proud to um, So a blue dot trail video. It has a map in the very first few images. Do you, do you have the blue dot trail video? Um, okay, I don't think, oh, now I've got two videos. You sent me two videos, one of the biodiversity. Is that the one you mean? That's the second one, no. Oh, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the Blue Dot Trail yeah. video. <laughs> oh, um, I, I just, all right. then what I'll, then what I'm going to tell you then is you can have a look at the Blue Dot Trail video. It should be on our website. If you like, I can go to the website now, Nora, and, uh, and show it from there. Okay, that's great. Okay, I'll, um, I'll just do that. Because that orients people to the site okay. if, they, um, if they haven't been there or if they have been they particularly enjoy it too we had a we had a young videographer a uh, recent graduate from Ryerson um, in photographs and digital and um, putting together things like that and uh, Donovan did a wonderful blue dot video for us. The um, money was donated by one of our local artists, which sort of stimulated us moving forward into this video um, presentation. Um, uh, Sharon Seibert, whose art some of you will know already. She's a wonderful local artist who does a lot of her um, paintings 
inspired by the York Lands Green Hub. This is a large piece of property in the east part of Guelph on the on York Road um, and uh, more like a country estate property from Britain for those of you who have done traveling in that part of the world. So we are a not-for-profit organization that really wants to keep part of it for the public now that it's all being sold off and it's no longer an institution. Okay, I have the video here. Okay, good. Let's look at that and, and watch for the map. Can you expand it? Okay, great. There's the map. And you can download that from the website. Okay, so you saw the map and, and that video walked you all the way around the loop, which gives you an idea of some of the terrain out there. Um, a lot of acreage and a lot of ponds and streams and waterfalls, etc. So now the second video that we were able to um, have Donovan make for us is a little longer than that. It is um, last Thursday, uh, uh, one of our favorite biologists, Matthew Isles, shared two hours of the early part of the morning from 7 to 9 a.m. And Donovan sort of followed him around the York lands, around a lot of that property that you just saw and around the two little lakes there. So this is a video of following a, a, a bird lover around and someone who knows the science and has studied it and um, is really looking for the biodiversity um, habitat that's there that will support many species, not just birds.
Being part of the 2022 Rivers Festival in Guelph is a great pleasure for the York Lands Green Hub. Our heritage landmark park on York Road is an ideal place to enjoy various birds in migration or in their habitat. We hope to inspire public interest of all ages in the birds around us wherever they are. But here in these mixed meadows, streams, ponds, and wooded trails, we have an ideal place for sharing nature discoveries that often escape our notice on our streetscapes or backyards. Urban ornithology is a part of environmental stewardship that is one of our goals. To strengthen urban resilience, we need to have natural spaces for other species to thrive. And birds are a critically important part of the web of life. The water that flows on through this property flows into the Aramosa River, then joins the Speed River as it runs through the heart of Guelph to Cambridge to be part of the largest watershed in Ontario, the entire Grand River watershed. The Grand River watershed is listed by Parks Canada as one of Parks Canada's heritage rivers. Here at the Yorklands, you will find an ideal place to learn more about ecological sustainability as you notice nature. Today, we are very pleased to have with us wildlife biologist Matthew Isles, whose background in ecology, ornithology, and conservation outreach emphasizes the importance of stewardship of these green spaces to a future that benefits all species, including people. Taking this brief visit with us will show you some of the delights of being a bird watcher. It is being captured by photographer and mixed media artist Donovan Vistari, whose link is on the website as well. Thanks. So we're just hanging out here at the York Clams this morning, doing a bit of bird watching. Beautiful day, lots of stuff singing. There's one bird actually right at the top of this tree called a little chipping sparrow. But there's another pretty cool bird here, a warbler, that we might try and find. It's called an American red star. There are a couple of them this morning. And it's a bird that I thought was like more of a big forest kind of breeding bird here in North America up in Canada, but actually they seem to breed in any number of little foresty patches, including here in the city. Yeah, often, not always, birds are not always the most cooperative of animals. They, they're doing their own thing, they're hiding out, they're feeding, they're singing to kind of mark out their territory. They're pretty, a lot of these small songbirds are not bothered by what humans are up to, the small scale of things. So, Patience can be a real key to getting a good look at some of these little birds. I'm sure this red starts on the edge. It just flew out here. Yeah. I don't know if you can catch it, but it's on that limb of the spruce sticking out towards the top. A couple of song sparrows carrying food there. Seen much more of that at this time of year, like late June, like birds actually carrying food, which means that they're usually taking it to the nest, which is a good sign when they've got young ones and they're looking out for them. There's a goldfinch there, I think. Um, but yeah, this is a good spot as well, particularly as you know the birds are kind of concentrating more on looking after their young. Migration's kind of done with for the spring. Can't yet get excited about fall migration. So, the summer is a good time to watch birds, yeah, but also to get interested in dragonflies, damselflies, butterflies, um, and pollinator gardens here and in these marshy areas. We're going to start seeing a lot more of those kind of animals, and dragonflies in particular. Some nice diversity there. Just heard a swamp sparrow singing here as well. Um, sporadic, but they do that kind of slow tss, 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 kind of song. They're just these like simple notes drawn out and repeated, pretty boring. But once you recognize it, they're a real nice bird to get familiar with. Nice little hot spot here on the edge of, I guess, the most easterly pond. 
and it's like a bit of marshy habitat here. Some nice kind of big maple trees, willow trees. And yeah, there's quite a few species around here. It's back again here, this indigo bunting. Nice male hanging around, singing. These metallic like, chip noises you might be able to hear. And there was also a pair of warbling vireos in this tree, the male singing quite rambunctiously. And there's tree swallows flying around, barn swallows as well over here. We had a rose-breasted grosbeak a minute ago. And then there's a yellow warbler singing as well, spreading. So, yeah, quite a lot of activity here this morning. Here's the indigo bunting. Morning, yeah. Yeah, nice um, common species there that we just saw, the yellow warbler. One of the most common warbler species that you will see in this part of Canada during the summer months, especially. Um, and they are bright yellow. Like the name suggests, but the males also have these beautiful bright red streaks down the side. I don't know how well that one is cooperating for you, to be able, for you to be able to see that, but when you do see it, it's beautiful and striking. And that one was hunting around on the edge of the, um, the pond here and catching some insects, but it seemed to be taking that insect straight out of here, and probably to a nest that it has along the river here. Uh, which is the, between the edge of the pond and Clive Creek. Uh, perfect habitat for yellow wolves. That's a cedar waxwing. Which a band of yellow across the tail of this particular beautiful. Sometimes on the wings, these like, well, it's the thing that gives them these, their name, these like little red waxy tips. Some of the wing feathers. And there's quite a bit of bird life around here right now. We've seen a few species that we hadn't encountered yet this morning or the other day. We just had a beautiful green heron fly right over us. There's a gray tree frog calling there, one of the first I've heard this year. Um, there's quite a number of yellow warblers here. There's a pair of see the wax wings close by um, and yeah we also had a brown thrasher that was lurking around in the bushes here not making too much noise stuck his head out a couple of times big beautiful long brown bird, big tail big curved bill um, closely related to the mockingbird and the catbird and the brown thrasher is actually reported to have the widest vocabulary of the most songs of any songbird, at least in North America, which is pretty cool. But you'll recognize them when they sing because they repeat every song that they're impersonating twice. Like, that kind of thing. But always repeat it twice. So that's a pretty common species that you're likely to see here or elsewhere in the city or in the backyard. Nice little song sparrow. That's the male doing his territorial song. Um, a lot of these small songbirds, we call them sparrows, robins, finches, etc. Warblers. The males have like a typical song that they use and kind of define their territory. And that way they don't have to come with physical blows. They don't have to fight. They just spend their time singing and marking their territory and that way the other males don't come into their land into their area so much. Um, just singing away there. This little sparrow, you can tell their song. Um, it's quite variable and like you can hear the differences between different individuals. 
often, um, but usually it's like kind of mechanical. It's in a few different parts. There's usually those first couple of slow notes, doom, doom, and then it goes like chicka chicka chicka, something like that. It's usually like in three parts, so starting with those couple of slow notes. The rest can flip around a bit more variably. So this is the eBird app. Um, really useful tool that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago on my Birding for Beginners workshop. Um, but you can download this, so you can sign up and just use it on the internet. But essentially you can, yeah, you can tally all your species that you have at a certain location. This is everything we've seen this morning. A couple more blue jays than that. But yeah, literally you can have a number in for each species. You can specify um, if you see breeding evidence, like you've seen baby birds, you've seen an adult carrying food to the nest. Um, then you can chart your checklists for the year at each location. Um, and also it's a great way to contribute to, um, to citizen science programs. So a lot of this data will get used and analyzed by scientists who are keeping an eye on the populations at a more continental level. But even yet, yeah, adding checklists in your backyard or at a site that you visit regularly, like for your plants here, is a great way to contribute to those um, research projects. And also it's a great tool to help you learn more birds and chart your own progress through becoming a better bird watcher. Thank you for sharing a few minutes to learn about some of the natural attributes of this unique heritage landscape in Guelph. On our website, we have captured some of its history since 1900 and welcome public input and old photos of the many public activities that were enjoyed here in the last century. We are working to keep these meadows, ponds and trails in the country estate-like place for continued public enjoyment. Your donations, memberships and volunteer hours make this possible. Okay, that was beautiful. Yeah, it is. He, they captured it. When you think it was only two hours, I think it's wonderful what yeah. they captured. Yeah. When I, anytime I go out walking there, I might see half a dozen birds, but when you know what, what you're looking for, it's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to take a minute to read you the species that they cataloged in that two hour period on that day. Um, because there were 45 different species, wow. which is amazing. <laughs> and it starts with the one that's most obvious that we always see out there with the Canada geese. And they noted at least 60 Canada geese. 12 mallards, one merganser, 14 rock pigeons, eight morning doves, seven chimney swifts. That's really And chimney swifts are uh, it's either a species at risk or a threatened species, but that'd be wonderful if, if that's where they are. Um, one herring gull, one great blue heron, one green heron, turkey vulture, one belted kingfisher, three northern flickers, two willow flycatchers, one eastern phoebe, three eastern kingbirds, three warbling vireos, one red-eyed vireo, seven blue jays, eight black-capped chickadees, six northern rough-winged swallows, eight tree swallows, 12 barn swallows. And we don't have a barn, so <laughs> I'm not sure what they're saying out there. A one house wren, 29 European starlings, one catbird, one brown thrasher, 22 robins, nine cedar waxwings, 11 American goldfinch, five chipping sparrows, three savanna sparrows, 11 song sparrows, one swamp sparrow, four eastern meadowlarks, and that is a species that's threatened, um, three Baltimore orioles, 16 red-winged blackbirds, 
six brown-headed cowbirds, four common grackles, five common yellowthroats, two American red starts, 11 yellow warblers, one pine warbler, two northern cardinals, two rose-breasted grosbeaks, and two indigo bunting. 45 different species. I, I, I was just blown away by that diversity because that indicates those things are finding things to eat. So the insect populations are varied and, and multiple there too, obviously. And obviously some of these want some of the, you know, like the kingfisher, they are looking after little things that are in the water, like little fish. So there is rich biodiversity in that spot, which, um, which is uh, backing up um, our um, important, the importance of us to keep this for a public treasure for Guelph. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any questions or do you want to save your questions to the end? Because we now have a, okay, so we now have a very special part. Kiki Danninger has made a presentation for us and Kiki is a plant and wildflower specialist. I, um, I first got to know her walking at the York lands and she sees things, picks them out that I haven't noticed before. So this year she's um, the leader for our poly patches and I'm going to let Kiki tell you all about it because she's doing such a wonderful job for us. Kiki, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, over to you. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Kiki. As uh, Nora mentioned, I'm a very passionate wildflower gardener. I'm part of the Master Gardeners of Guelph Wellington and I've been gardening and teaching workshops for about I would say 10 years. Uh, so this year I am the project coordinator of a program, a pilot project by Yorklands called Poly Patches. A lot of peas in there. So this program, Poly Patches, aims to get residents of East Guelph um, excited and involved and participating in creating wildlife and pollinator habitats in their front yard. So we have, um, we had, uh, with the program, we put out a poster and we had nearly 100 applications and we were only able to accept around 15. So we hope to really expand the program next year, make it sort of, we would love to have like a pollinator pathway going through the city and, you know, eventually let it go nationwide, things like that. So I have a little slideshow and I'm going to talk during the slideshow. I just, uh, fingers crossed it actually works. I'm using it on a Mac, which is a little bit tricky. So I'm going to attempt sharing my screen. Let's see. Ah. Can everyone see that? Mm, wonderful. Is it centered? Um, yeah, I, I see your PowerPoint on the left. Okay. How about now? If you press play, you'll see uh, it on the full screen. All right, how about that? There you go. All right, so let's, let me just start it from the beginning. So the idea with the poly patches was to create a small, almost like postage stamp sized little garden under people's trees in their boulevard where all that grass usually is. So a lot of our participants ended up actually incorporating the poly patch within their own garden. A lot of them had a couple native plants or like small shrubs and they wanted to create a better habitat. So the other thing to remember with our poly patches, it's not only a pollinator garden where we're feeding and like ideally attracting many different pollinators and birds. We want it also to be a nesting site. So that means we need some uncovered ground. We need sort of little natural areas that aren't being trampled on or sprayed by anything or heavily mulched just to, because a lot of our bees are ground nesting. And we just want to sort of recreate their natural environment rather than investing or trying to recreate it via like little boxes and, and such. So these are where uh, sort of roughly all of our poly patches are. If everyone can see those, I sort of have a little pin for each one. We wanted the, can't really bring my mouse over, but we wanted to sort of mainly stick to East Guelph and then we have a couple in the ward just so it's easy to go around and check them. 
So at the end of May, we delivered all the plants and then it's the participants that were given instructions on how to install those gardens and what type of things to look out for, like what sort of observations that they should be um, doing. And we've got little signs uh, because this project was generously funded by a community grant from Pollination Guelph. We have quite a few Pollination Guelph signs and we're also making some of our own signs just to help the neighbors or anyone walking by understand why maybe some gardens look a little different or why maybe we're leaving flower stalks up for um, pollinators in the winter to nest in. So the pollinator signs sort of explain what a habitat is. It'll say like we have food, we have no pesticides and we create natural nesting sites. And it really gets a lot of people interested in uh, asking questions. And these are sort of a few of the different plants, well, the calendula and the corner, uh, ignore that, it's just a really cute picture. We had a couple different plants in each package. We tried to make each garden have a different variety of plants because we don't want like complete copies of each other all over the place. So we had a variety of plants that bloom at a variety of different times from spring through to fall. So we had asters, we had some summer wildflowers, we had sort of really like bee favorites like bergamot or bee balm, things like that, that bees really love but aren't easy to find sometimes. And we had prairie spiderwort. Uh, Echinacea is technically not a native plant, but it's been introduced and it's a very valuable uh, nectar source for different types of insects and birds as well. There's also, um, as a gardener, I know a lot of people have a hard time suddenly trying to switch their garden to a, like a wildlife supporting habitat. It can be expensive, it can be confusing, and you don't want to suddenly pull out a bunch of food sources that, you know, insects in your area were relying on. You can always grow your own annuals if you really like summer color or you're just used to having hanging baskets everywhere. Some things I love growing are sweet alyssum, nasturtiums, and cosmos. I always find them covered in bees. I like to grow my own just to make sure that the seeds haven't been treated with um, neonectinoids or pesticides. And so they really add a pop of color and they, you can sort of still try to make sure you have a nectar source during a time where you're doing construction on your garden or you notice you have nothing blooming. So we created this bloom chart here. So like over here, you would, uh, you see over there the Latin name. So you'd try to figure out which plants you already have. You'd write down the common name. So some people call something, you know, a brown-eyed Susan. Um, so you'd write down Rudbeckia and a brown-eyed Susan, and then whether it was a wildflower, a shrub, and then you sort of color in, the idea for all our participants is to color in the month that it's blooming. Ideally, you'd have this nice thick zigzag going down the chart. So during every month, you have one or two things blooming, so you're providing a constant food source for pollinators. And then after food, this second most important, that's putting it um, simply, would be water and nesting sites. So with water, I, ha I have these fantastic rocks in my backyard. It's a type of limestone aggregate. I wish I knew where to get more, but it's, it has these natural little dips in it and they're amazing because they gather water. So after it rains or after, I don't know, I spill water or something, I have these little puddles of water everywhere for pollinators to drink from. You can recreate it. You can take a, a ceramic glazed dish, put a couple rocks in it, and fill that with water. They, they don't want something too deep because they might fall in and have a hard time getting out. Everyone I'm sure has seen a bee in a big puddle of water and you've helped it out with a leaf. So I like to make sure that whatever it is isn't too deep or they have a way to get out. And I don't necessarily want my bird bath where the bees are, otherwise it might become a buffet. So um, if you have like areas in your garden that you can keep moist, like if you have a nice little mud patch or you have a little tray of rocks that you can ensure has water all the time, that's an excellent water source for um, pollinators. And then I know some people find snakes a little scary, but as a gardener who is not a huge fan of slugs, but also don't want to be using pesticides, I really like attracting toads and snakes to my garden. I try to keep them on opposite ends. So if you create a nice rock pile in a very sunny part of your yard, you'll naturally attract some garter snakes, which are great for certain pests. Just sort of keeps things in balance. And a brush pile, which is sort of like, just, you know, I gather up leaves and branches and things so I don't trip over them in the path. And I just make a nice tidy pile in the corner of my garden that I don't really go through too often. So it's a nice low traffic area. And that's important for a lot of things like when, um, like for caterpillars, when they, you know, turn into a little chrysalis and such, you, you need them to have a nice, safe, quiet place. 
I'm um, sure some chipmunks are living in there too. And another thing to remember is that dead wood, like a stump or an old log, is a vital, vital nesting site for a lot of different insects. So a lot of bees like to nest in wood. Um, I'm sure you've seen carpenter bees going into your deck. So if you provide them something else, they might hopefully leave your deck alone. And then, um, so with the, poly, with the poly patches one, Yorkland does another program called Ten Tall Trees where we'd go into schools in Guelph and um, teach the kids there about trees and then sort of have an art component so they could really have a chance to be creative. What, we, what I noticed with so many of the kids when they were drawing this, you know, in the art section was how much they noticed, you know, squirrels and birds and everything. So the poly patches are really great for our participants who have children because the kids will just sit there all day with a little pen and paper and be writing down what's visiting. And it's the power of observation, like shouldn't be underestimated. Like if you just sit long enough by your little a bowl of water or by some of your flowers, the amount of visitors you'll get is pretty incredible. This is again from our 10 Tall Trees program. So it's really good to maybe encourage uh, kids or teenagers to draw out some flowers they see and, and like ask them, is there a particular month where you, do, where you see specific flower a lot? Do you know what that flower is? And is there some months where there's no flowers, where everything seems like it's just green? What do you think we could add then? So I've given all of our participants lists of resources where they could find um, like sort of what types of native plants to add to their garden that bloom during specific times. And uh, yeah, that is the end of my slideshow. And then I have a sort of questions and answers if anyone has any questions. Or we could do that at the end as well. So I'll just sort of do a little summary. So Poly Patches, the little garden program aims to get residents of Guelph involved and excited about pollinators and absorbing wildlife in their gardens. You want to create a wildlife habitat or a pollinator garden by providing a source of food, a source of water, and a source of shelter or places for them to nest. And you can always grow, you know, annuals that are very nectar rich and pollen rich. You can grow those for, um, for summer color if you feel like certain perennials or certain native plants, if you don't have enough of them as of yet. Or let's say you added some native plants to your garden and they're, they're not going to be blooming this year, they might bloom next year. You could sort of see what you could carry along with you. Just make sure whatever plants you plant come from a reputable source, like even the seeds, to make sure they haven't been treated with uh, pesticides or neonicotinoids, which can have an adverse effect on the pollinators you're trying to attract. And um, yeah, I think that's sort of all I had in my head at the time. I, I haven't seen that before, Kiki. I think you've done a great job of pulling together your little program. Oh, uh, thank super. you. Um, I also noted that you, the pictures you showed are open flowers with the stamens very visible, like your yes. cosmos had, had, was not the um, multiple petaled cosmos that's really hard for pollinators to get into the center of to get that. Exactly. Or you even see with peonies, you'll see a bumblebee struggling with its little arms trying to get all the way to the center or certain, um, like a lot of ornamentals are bred to last for a very long time. And in doing that, they've lost a lot of their nectar. Similar how when you go to a flower shop, you get these roses that'll last for weeks and weeks, but they have absolutely no smell at all. So you want to make sure that whatever you're planting, the insects can actually get to the pollen. Or you'll know like hummingbirds, they need a specific shape of flower, like long-tongued bees, like bees need specific flowers. So it's really good to understand what your pollinators are trying to eat and even though like I have you know let's say I have some beautiful heirloom peonies in my backyard you know I love them and I'm not recommending that anyone yank out their peonies if they bring you you know great joy but you can always say well those aren't really doing much for the bees around me they're doing a lot for me but what can I add around those peonies to get you know to make sure I don't have this like sterile part of my garden so open flowers are like, I love marigolds, but they're, they're so fluffy. And I, I feel so sad when I see a bee try to get in and then they just fly away. So you can actually grow mini marigolds. They're about this big, very tiny. And they've got about five or six petals and they're just covered in pollen. And the, they're very, very good for like little teeny tiny bees. Okay, I didn't know that. Where do you get those? What, what, what is the name of those kinds of marigolds? Um, I'm not sure. I've always called them mini marigolds. I get the seeds from a farmer I know in Hamilton. Um, I'll, I'll have to make a bunch of seed packets. Good. We could. Uh, easy we could, to grow. We could 
put that information on um, on our in one of our newsletters sometime. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. That's super. Um, we have any questions so far? Um, there are, are a few questions I see. Um, if you want to open your chat box, you can. Um, can you see the questions in the chat box? Yeah, I can see one. Um, resource online to know what flower and plants to plant during which month. So there is, a, I have actually created a little PDF with a bunch of resources. So I'm going to add that to the chat box. I think I can. So it's called resources YL plus two rivers. So it's a little PDF. The links are clickable. And there is any of those links, you'll be able to find a lot more information about native plants and pollinator gardening and wildlife support. So one that I recommend is, and a thing you have to sort of keep in mind is not all flowers will flower during the same time. So a flower that I had in Toronto might bloom a lot sooner than a flower I have in Guelph. So I recommend always buying from a nursery in your area. A really amazing nursery, which can um, really provide with a lot of different things is Bee Sweet Nature Co. They're in Puslinch. It's about a 20 minute drive from Guelph. They do wildflowers, shrubs, and trees. Uh, Pollination Guelph, as we know, is a wealth of resources. They have lists of plants that'll bloom during specific seasons. And Can Plant is a directory of native plants. They also have lists of nurseries and related information. So those first three resources I named you can find lists of plants for specific seasons. So I always try to have like a blend and I try to make sure I have things overlapping. So for example, for spring, I love Virginia bluebells. For summer, I love, uh, there's like so many flowers in summer, it's pretty hard, but my favorite has got to be button bush because it's just like, it's very prolific. And then for fall, I like things like asters or um, um, black eyed Susans, those are really great. So the PDF, you should be able to click to open it or download it. I've put it into the chat box and all the links within the PDF should be clickable. So by going through those resources, you can find the information you need. And Erica had a question earlier calling, uh, asking about the app. And I think since it was at 2.30, it was probably the app that Matthew um, Isles was talking about with the birds, eBird. Um, it's just eBird app. And Matthew also has done another bird watching um, um, two, two weeks ago uh, for the York Lands as part of the Two Rivers Festival. And there are more links in that. So I think what I'll do is, is get those links and I'll give them to you, um, to, uh, Beth, the host, and maybe we could add them to the end of this video so that people who have been listening to it today can have a look at the, the other bird watching uh, video or links as well. Okay. Okay. Yep. So that is, um, that brings us have one more question okay. here. about. Uh, oh, where can we share? buy? Seeds? Yeah. Kiki, do you want to answer this? Where can we buy seeds without pesticides? So I would recommend buying those from your local native plant nursery. So those, a lot of the nurseries at uh, canplant.ca, they have a section on their website called nurseries or plant people or like where you can buy plants from. A lot of those nurseries sell seeds to like can sell seeds to you directly. I also like gathering seeds from my own garden, like a red columbine. Uh, if you have too much leaf litter around some of your plants, the seeds might not be able to get to the ground properly. So in the fall is one of the best times to plant native plant seeds. So I would just gather around dried seed heads, not too many, you wanna leave some for the birds, of course, and just sprinkle those dried seeds sort of in different areas of your garden, just to move it around. But as for buying like specific uh, plant seeds, I would recommend reaching out to uh, your local native plant nursery. So, um... Eric is asking, she can't see the PDF. Uh, can anyone see the PDF? I, um, I can see it. I'm just trying to figure out if there's a way that I can, I can probably send it or, or maybe you could. Uh, well, I have, I, I have access to people's email addresses since they are. All right, I can, I'll can forward you an email, Beth, with all the attachments and you can okay. forward that to everyone. So they have a That's one tidy place for all of them. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Kiki. 
So the last part, we just have a few more minutes here. Um, the last part is, 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 um, has to do with the biodiversity of the creeks and the water in the Yorklands. Last year, anyone who was at the BioFest or BioBlitz that we had on, I think it was on the 28th of June last year too, um, we had the pollinator group went out to the fields and um, the birders went up to the trees on the trails. And Bob Giza, the head of um, Terra Streams, he um, got down into Clyth Creek and pulled out some um, water from the bottom of the creek down underneath the rocks and um, showed people in the, in the water what, it, what is an indicator insect, a water insect that you can look for that will show you the health of the water. So this year, um, Bob was in a bit of a hurry and um, we didn't get him to um, put much time in there. So we'll have to get him again another time, but we do have a, a few photographs from last year um, for anybody who just wants to see how it went. And then we have um, two or three minutes of Bob on Clyde Creek showing you some of the species on the rocks when he brings them out. So if you want to put that on, that would be good. Yeah, thank you. Got... Yes, I'm. I'm uh, working on it here, Nora. <laughs> okay. So uh, while she's working on it, I want to say I have these wonderful placemats that are made by the Arboretum in Guelph. They have 17 different ones. And um, the, right now with summer, I think the butterflies and the birds and the insects, they're fantastic placemats. If you um, just want to keep them on your table when you're having your coffee, you'll notice ones then when you're out in the field that day or for a walk, you'll say, oh yeah, right, that's what that was. And it sort of increases our interest by knowing the names of some of these wonderful species that are here and we often don't, don't see them. Okay, great. I think I've got this video now. In 2019, we had a bio blitz for the Two Rivers Festival with volunteers helping from Nature Guelph, Pollination Guelph, and Guelph Urban Forest Friends. However, this year, 2020, we must have a virtual visit to the Yorklands. Bob Giza was able to give us a few minutes to review the three main water insects that are present in clean water habitat. Yeah, Bob, tell us, tell me what you see when you look at a place like this. Well, as a biology teacher in high school, I used to always go to aquarium shops looking for a plant called Elodea canadensis, the Canadian Elodea, not the foreign one, especially from south of the border. And this thing was great to take the leaves, look under a compound microscope and see a thing called cytoplasmic streaming where you would see the chloroplasts looking like little cars running around the outside of the, uh, of the cell. It was great to get that. And this pond right here in front of me, all of this stuff, I hate to go into this water, but just for the sake of science, I'll do it. And I'll pull out a clump of Elodea canadensis. The Canadian, this is Elodea canadensis. This stuff here, we're going to have a close-up of this. Okay. Great, great, great one. was one simple lesson plan on cytoplasmic streamers. Oh, the cytoplasm would go around the cell, and because the chloroplast would sit in the cytoplasm, they would be pulled around like little cars putting around the track of a cell. These are the big three are stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies. Here we have... If you see at the end of my finger, that is a caddisfly that has crawled out from his case that he built of these little pebbles. He sticks them together for protection and he lives inside. I find the most gorgeous are the log home ones that are built. It looks like a little log home. And if you look at the end very gently, you'll see a caddisfly inside. Um, they're found throughout North America, right up to Hudson Bay, I've seen them. Caddisflies are of the order Trichoptera. The mayflies, ephemeroptera, ephemera meaning very simple lifestyle, lives for one day and die. And then you have my favorite, 
the plecopter or the stonefly. So those are the big three. Thank you very much. End of the lesson for today. So, so you can so you can see Bob was in a hurry and uh, off he went for a week of fishing north of Tomogamy <laughs> into the past the Quebec border. So that's um. That'll give you an idea of much of the variety that forms the biodiversity at the Yorklands. And I hope sometime you'll be able to get out there to see for yourself how easy it is to access the property and enjoy it from many points of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. And thank you, Kiki. And, and uh, uh, a long distance thank you to Bob and uh, Matthew also and everyone else who uh, was uh, involved in making those films. They were they were great. I guess I guess we're done. So say goodbye to everybody and thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs>